Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Old Fashioned On Purpose podcast. So we've had a few episodes, not back to back, but fairly recently about beef. We've been talking about beef myths. We've been busting through some of the misinformation that's floating around. I know a lot of you loved the episode with Diana Rogers. Uh, And in that vein, I wanted to have someone, you probably have seen her around social media, or maybe you've listened to her podcast, uh, Natalie Kovorik. Kovorik. There we go. I wrote it down and I forgot. Natalie Kovorik is a ranch wife, a mom, and a social entrepreneur who lives in the Nebraska Sand Hills. And she is a wonderful advocate for agriculture and all that it entails. So I've been really looking forward to this conversation and welcome to the podcast today, Natalie. Thank you, Jill. I'm so honored to be here. I think you have been, you know, I've followed you since I've been online, which feels like a long time ago. So yes. it's an honor to be on your podcast uh, chatting, like you said, all thing beef. It's something I'm pretty passionate about. Yeah, absolutely. So can you give everyone a little bit of background on how you got into this world and why you are so passionate about it? Yeah, um, not uncommon in agriculture. I actually grew up in it. So I was raised in Southwest Montana on a ranch. Um, a little bit different than agriculture, I did kind of leave it and not like totally leave it, but I got my degree in pharmacy. So <clears throat> my parents kind of gave us the gift of choice. They really wanted to make sure if we ever came back to the operation, it was, you know, because we wanted to, not because we felt we had to, or, you know, that was the only thing we could do. So I practice full-time pharmacy. I lived in a bigger city, you know, bigger quotation is definitely relative for the state of Montana. But, um, you know, I live near our family ranch, but I certainly never thought my income would be derived from it. I never thought I would be sharing online about it. You know, I was supposed to be a pharmacist. And then I met my husband, um, married him, and that's how I ended up down here in central Nebraska. And he ranches, and my life just kind of came full circle. Um, And I originally started sharing online, actually, for a direct-to-consumer beef business. Um, Jill, you know, you would know. You kind of have to, like, share your story. and you know, connect to your consumers if you're going to sell beef online. And so I did that for a little bit. And then I ended up pivoting away from that to kind of doing what I do now, which is just sharing more about our family story and just kind of advocating for the industry as a whole. Yes. And I I was looking at your website uh, earlier today, and I loved when you said that you're, you and your husband are first generation ranchers with uh, fifth generation roots. Is that how you phrase it? Yeah, he's fifth and I'm fourth. And, um, but what we, you know, run and operate today, um, he kind of built from the ground up. Yeah. Which I, I especially as also first generation find that really, really ex- inspiring. I love the stories and we're surrounded by families who are fourth, fifth, sixth generation, which is fantastic. But my husband and I didn't have that. And so to see other people who are starting from the ground up, it always gives me all the warm fuzzies. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's, I don't know if interesting is the right word, but, um, having, being exposed to both sides, like kind of that, you know, passing on to the next generation, trying to figure that out. And also having, you know, obviously when you have things being passed down to you, it's a little bit different than as you would know, when Mm -hmm. you're trying to cash flow and and grow and expand and do everything your own. And so having, I guess the perspective of both sides for me has been pretty eye opening. Um, you know, it's the grass isn't greener. It's uh, just different on both sides. That's a good way to put it. So you're, I love how outspoken and bold you are on social media and what you share. You're not afraid to hit the hard issues, which, um, it seems almost crazy to me how controversial agriculture has become, you know, maybe it always has had an element of that, but especially the last few years, like you can hardly say anything about food in general, even without causing some sort of upheaval. So I know it takes a lot of grit to come out and say what you say. So I want to just say, I recognize that and I really appreciate your boldness, um, but let's just dive into the good stuff. I find the anti-meat narrative right now to be so aggressive and so exhausting. I would love your perspective on what is who or what is driving that and why we're seeing such an uptick in that right now, especially. Yeah, I wish I knew the direct source. I would maybe go right after it. Yep, I'm sure you would. <laughs> um, but yeah, like you said, I, this is actually something I kind of struggle with a little bit. Sometimes I wonder if I'm like in an echo chamber and I've like created this narrative around me that, I mean, I feel like you can, and maybe I've actually even heard you talk about this on your podcast, but I feel like anymore you can kind of go online and whatever narrative you want to find to support your belief, yeah. you can kind of yeah. find, right? The algorithm's built to show you who, you know, what you like, what you believe in, what you want to see. And so sometimes I'm like, gosh, you know, is this anti nate meat narrative as strong as I think it is? Do we need to be worried about it? Like you said, is it this powerful thing? Uh, Or am I just kind of like making this mountain out of a molehill? 
And I swear every time I kind of ask myself that question, something will like left hook me in society that I'm like, wow, no, this is places that we need to be concerned about. I had a friend text me, you know, she was at a museum in Chicago and there was propaganda in that museum about, you know, you know, beef and the environment and what we should be doing with our diets. And uh, there was a popular podcaster the other day who ended his podcast with, well, cows are the problem, you know, and he probably streams to millions of people. And I don't know how in touch he is with the agriculture industry. And so I do think there is this concern. I think it's making, maybe we could talk about this in a little bit, but it's making its way into some school systems. Um, yes. Kids are being taught some of these things. And so, you know, I struggle with how loud is it? Is this you know, voice over here, just really loud. Um, or are they loud in a lot of them and, you know, whatever it comes down to the end of the day, I think it's just important that people like you and I put out the right information so that whether that voice is, you know, everywhere or not, there's at least the opposite side that shedding light on some of the truth for people who really want to do seek it out, that they can find it. Um, as far as where I think it's coming from, you know, the second part of your question, I think a lot of things play into a role. Um, one, obviously, I think that there are certain um, organizations that it's you know advantageous for them to kind of attach themselves to, I guess I'll just say it, like activists, um, you know, people who want to end animal agriculture. I think it's advantageous for them to a- attach themselves. Um, used, they used to be able to go off of kind of just the emotional pillar of getting, you know, people to want to, to not eat meat or not have, you know, animal agriculture. And now I think they've weaseled their way into like the climate part of it and kind of seeing like, oh, if we can attach our bandwagon to this, you know, that's another way to maybe get more people, you know, to support and believe in, in our motives. Um, I think celebrities, I think social media has done a lot to kind of like feed people's um, narratives and voices who don't have just their personal belief, right? That's all they're sharing that then kind of gets a stamp of approval or influences people. So I think it's coming at us from a lot of different ways. Yeah, I agree. And I like what you said about the echo chamber, because I think we do have to be so careful, especially online. Um, more than once I've caught myself and and the algorithms are built to create those. So it's not even like it's our fault. It just happens. Mm -mm. Um, but one thing though, I think I, I know I get served more either pro beef or anti beef, um, messaging just because of my platform and what the algorithms see me interacting with, but I have seen it more. Um, it's kind of one of those things like society is taking it on as like, you know, be a good person, smile at strangers, recycle your bottles and don't eat as much meat. And I'm like, wait, 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 <laughs> stop. You guys don't know what you're saying or why you're saying that. So I, I feel like it may be, it's more aggressive in some circles, but I do feel like there's this underlying like acceptance that it's just the way to be and no one's questioning why. Yeah. I think it's absolutely starting to work its way into like a lifestyle, which yes. is concerning because I don't know if we'll dive into it or not, but, and I know Diana touched on it, but like from a nutritional standpoint, I think we really have to be careful about what we're recommending people do. I would love to talk about that. Cause I, you mentioned the schools and that was something that was really brought to my attention after reading sacred cow, which is Diana and Rob Wolf's book. Um, I was so focused on the environmental aspects of beef, which are really important. I'd love to still talk about those, but we, I think we're overlooking the nutritional aspects and Mm-hmm. maybe in that our country, we might have uh, more weight, but we're actually undernourished. So can you speak to that a little bit and what you've found? Yeah. So I think people, again, we sometimes, um, to no fault of our own, we ask for things and we don't really understand the implications of what we're asking for. Right. So for me, I look at when people are like, I want to remove meat from the diet and that's what we should be doing. Like you said, smile, recycle, don't eat meat. Yeah. Um, if we remove that, there's the nutritional component. Um, and it's just, it's, it's pretty alarming what's being shown, um, out there. If you do background and research, I'm not a dietitian, which is kind of like you said, I always, you know, on my personal page, I choose to focus on a lot of the environmental point part because, you know, that's what I can speak to as a rancher. Um, so I kind of stayed away from it, but the more and more I dive into it, the more and more I'm starting to use my voice to it. Cause I do see the harms of removing animal proteins from our diet. We need protein that that's a scientific fact. Our bodies need protein to run on, right? Um, Animal proteins have all of the complete essential amino acids. Plant proteins do not. Um, If you're on a vegan or vegetarian diet, you're likely going to have to supplement with different things like vitamin B12. You know, there are different things that you cannot get from a plant-based diet that you can only get from an animal protein diet. And I just don't think we understand, you know, again, from a health standpoint, what 
would really happen if we push this narrative of removing meat. And then, like you said, uh, let's say we do take away meat. So not only are we deficient on, you know, some of these macro and micronutrients, but we're filling our body then with other unhealthy stuff potentially, right? Like not everyone is going to be able to sustain on just fruits and vegetables. Likely we're entering into the, the heavier carbs. Like you said, our nation as a, as a whole, we don't have a, you know, nutrition prop or we don't have a, um, how do I want to say it? We have a lot of calories. We don't have a yes. lot of nutrition. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. We have a colla- like we have a caloric ec- overload and a nutritional deficit. Um, and removing, you know, again, removing meat from the plate is only going to like further, further that essentially. Yeah. I've just even noticed it in myself. Um, I don't follow any specific diet, like paleo or keto. I I just kind of do what I want to eat the food we raise and call it good. But when I am traveling or I'm in town, it's number one, it's hard to find, it's harder to find the protein rich snacks or meals. If you're, if you're eating out, you're trying to get something fast. Our snack foods in America are very carb and grain heavy and they're not as, uh, they're not as satiating and they are, um, they just don't make you feel as good. And it's easy to overeat. And I notice, you know, just on my plate, when I have even a small amount of steak with a little bit of carb, I eat less, I feel better. I have an easier time maintaining my weight. I just, everything flows. So it's hard to imagine, um, anyone (laughs) trying to create a diet that's completely carb and grain based. Like, I feel like we, we would just create such a realm of problems. We're already halfway there with our standard American diet, but it would get even worse. Yeah. I, I don't know how it took me so long to realize this. Sometimes I feel like, you know, what, you know, you just, you think is like normal. Yeah. Um, and I think it was maybe when I was reading Diana's book, kind of like you had mentioned earlier. Um, but I'm like, I, I think I pretty much have eaten an animal protein almost six to seven nights of the week for my entire, you know, 35 years of life. Um, I just can't imagine. I mean, that's what we do in our house. Like we start with, okay, what do you want? Do you want steak, hamburger, (laughs) fish, you know, like yeah. we work through the animal proteins to start our meal with, and then we add in the sides. And, um, I just don't even know what people are cooking, honestly, if they're not, if they're not starting yeah. with the animal protein. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You have to eat a lot more of the macaroni and cheese or the mashed potatoes to make up if you don't have the protein balancing it. I know for me, at least it's easier for me to overeat when I don't have the meat, uh, keeping things where they need to be. Yeah. Like you said, um, there's, I think there's being more emphasis put on this, but cause a lot of people will be like, well, you can get the same amount of protein from broccoli. You can steak. Um, but it's like, you have to eat like, I mean, I don't know the exact numbers, yeah. but it, like, let's say it's like 15 cups of broccoli or whatever, you know, I mean the, the differences are going to be way, they're just, they're not the it's same. It's like you said, you have to consume way yeah. more. And then they're not, there's the risk that they're not even absorbed the same, you know? So it's been right. shown that animal proteins, um, First, plant proteins, plant proteins just aren't absorbed by our body um, as good. So even if you do get that same amount, you could potentially not be absorbing at all. So yeah, absolutely. So so part of the argument against beef right now is the nutrition aspect, or people saying it's not good for us. And the other side, of course, is that environmental piece, which is really loud, especially it feels like. Um, and the story kind of goes that cattle are ruining the planet; they're emitting the gases. You know, there's all the talk about the the greenhouse gases, but and of course, and they're using water, too much water, and they're you taking up our land. What's what are the parts of that conversation that that argument is missing? Um, wait, what do you mean? Like where that's I feel like everyone's ultra focused on those aspects, like the, the greenhouse gases and and those parts of the cattle discussion. But I feel it, it I feels like that's a little bit reductionist. So what other pieces of that are not being brought into view when people are saying cattle are bad for the environment? Oh, sure. Okay. So I think this is what you're asking me. I don't know why I'm struggling with this. Sorry. Question. That's okay. I, pro- I phrased um, it weird. It's, sorry. But you're right. So everyone has right now, um, there is this intense focus on like, uh, carbon, methane and greenhouse gas emissions. Like that's all everyone, anyone ever wants to talk about. Um, which is fine, right? Those are all measurable things that we can use. They, they do play a role in our environment. Um, it, you know, carbon and methane need to be regulated. We need to understand how they work and cattle play a role in that. Um, but when people only want to focus on that, which is sometimes what people call like carbon tunnel vision, like you said, we're leaving a lot of other things out of the discussion. Uh, one of which is the nutrition portion, right? So if we only cared about getting our greenhouse gas emissions down to a certain point, um, and we did that through reducing meat, which, um, 
isn't even the most effective way to do it, right? There's a ton of data and stats out there that show, you know, I mean, the EPA, the pie graph, you know, agriculture as a whole is 11% of our carbon emissions, of which animal agriculture within the agricultural whole is only less than 4%, right? Uh, Transportation, um, energy, and I don't know, I'm blanking on the third, they make up almost 80% of the rest of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, So I always feel like we're kind of like, we kind of maybe have bigger fish to fry is how I like to put it in a very simple way. Like, why are we even, you know, talking about removing meat? Um, Sure, it could reduce our greenhouse gas, but that's kind of like saying, you know, we have a dollar, you know, a hundred pennies to remove and we moved three, like, yay, we still have 97 other ones that are like sitting there that we need to work on. Um, and Frank Mitloner actually talks a little bit about how I think it's like two points are if everyone in the U S went plant-based, um, our reduction would only be like 2.6%. Okay. Mm-hmm. So again, everyone loves to focus on that and we could, but we take that away and n- now we have a diet problem. Um, another thing that no one likes to enter into the conversation is the good agriculture is actually doing. So we actually interviewed Dr. Holder on our podcast, Discover Ag, and he talked a lot about this. Like everyone loves to talk about the negative, but no one is balancing the conversation for like what, you know, properly grazed cattle can do for the environment. Right. So we're not talking about the biodiversity we're not talking about how they maintain grasslands. We're not talking about how they're better for the soil. Like we're not talking how they're a part of that carbon cycle, um, and what they're doing, um, you know, for our, um, basically I would say like our planet, our land, our soil, like cattle ruminants, um, are a benefit to the soil if they're properly managed. And then the third thing I'd say that, um, no one ever talks about either. or Some people do. It's again, just not as loud as, you know, carbon, methane and is byproducts, right? So Mm -hmm. if we talk about removing animals from, from, you know, I guess the planet, um, we have two things to talk about byproducts that they eat. So 86% of what cattle consume is actually not edible to humans. That's why they're great at what they do. It's why we want them around because, um, they turn grass, they turn non-edibles like distiller's grain, like, uh, almond, byproducts, um, like cotton seed, you know, they consume those things and turn it into protein for us to eat. Our ranch is a great example of that. I say that all the time. We're in the Nebraska sand hills, like you said in the intro. Um, it's a huge part of the state. Um, I don't know the exact acreage amount, but I know it's over 20,000. Um, I mean, it, actually, I think it's way more than that now that I say that out loud, cause that's not right. It, it's a vast, it's a large portion of the state of Nebraska. And the only thing it's good for is grazing cattle. You cannot farm it. Um, like we cannot do anything else with that land. Um, and Dr. Holder also talked about, you know, as we're feeding these byproducts to animals, again, these distiller grains, the almonds, the, um, cotton seed oil, for example, cattle are consuming them. If they don't consume them, they go to a landfill or they get composted. Yeah. Um, and there are studies out there that show our greenhouse gas um, emissions actually increase because cattle are no longer eating them. So we, cattle actually are offsetting, you know, we're giving other industries a lower carbon footprint because we're consuming it. So we'd actually see numbers go up. The other part of the conversation of byproducts is what um, animals contribute to that we use. So, you know, medicine is a huge thing that animals um play a role in like, uh, they're, they're in heparin, they're in, you know, pig heart valves. Um, I mean, I think we actually are interviewing someone on our podcast talking about this and there it's in crayons, it's in tennis rackets. I mean, what we use from the nose to the tail of a cow is it actually blows my mind. Um, the parts of society that are every single day that cattle make their way into, and I guess other animals too, but it's astounding if you were really to look at what they go into, I think people would be like, we'd have to stop. I mean, it would just, it would mess up so many things. Yeah. And I always think, so if we took, if not only took away the meat, but we took away all of the the, the byproducts that we're using in all those crayons and, and heart valves and such, then I'm assuming we'd have to create synthetic versions. And then a lot of that synthetic is, is, done with, um, or at least the synthetic lab-based meats are kind of grain-based, right? Am I saying that right? They have like that grain, soy, corn kind of base. Yeah. I don't know for sure, but I would think so. I don't, yeah. but I don't know for sure, but you're touching on like a whole, <laughs> a yeah, that's whole, a whole nother, nother like can of worms I love to get into, which yeah. is like, 
there was, we actually just covered this on our podcast. Um, California banned furs. And right now they haven't banned uh, wool or leather, thank goodness. Mm -hmm. Um, But I could see that like coming down the pipeline. Um, And it frustrates me so much because if they're coming from it from the environmental standpoint, it's like there's nothing more environmental friendly than using leather, hides, wool, and fur. If we have to create like quotation vegan leather, way more harmful for the environment than buying natural leather. So any, you know, that's like one of the things I get upset about most. Um, It like as far as the hypocrisy in that area is just like you want to stand for the environment, but then you'll like advocate for pleather um, and these artificial things that end up in our oceans. And again, way more harmful than repurposing the hide from an animal that's being used for yes, meat. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, yeah, that argument is often way overlooked. The, the whole uh, carbon emission thing stops all of a sudden when we start looking at what it takes to create those alternatives. I know I was, I saw something about the the lab meats or the beyond impossible, whatever they are. They said it, it has actually a pretty heavy footprint just when you look at all the inputs into this that had, you know, it took so much to create it. But I'm like, we're not asking those questions of those substances. And it gets, it, like you said, it gets really hypocritical. I mean, I can't imagine how, like, if you just step back big picture and didn't know anything about it and thought, you know, looked at a cow grazing and then harvested it and compared that to what it would take to manufacture lab meat, I can't even see how you think that manufacturing something would have less of the carbon footprint than the cow out at the pasture, you know? Yeah, totally. It's, yeah, there's have a disconnect. Have you seen those graphics that compare like dog food? the ingredients in like dog food to the ingredients in like a plant-based um, or not a plant-based. Yeah, it is. It's a plant-based oh burger. No. And how they're pretty much like the same. Yeah. That's a shocking, but not surprising. Someone, where, yeah. I was reading a book or something. They're talking about how the human diet is made up of so few ingredients. Um, like, like the standard American processed food diet, all the processed foods are basically made out of the same chemicals or like it's human kibble. And I'm like, that's, that just really is accurate and sad, but also really accurate. I can't remember who said it, but I was like, that works. That works. I, <laughs> so. I saw another one that was just going around. I'm like, so true. It's like first commercial, uh, your dog has to have real meat, like order <laughs> our fancy dog food. Second commercial. You're going to love our soybean burger. Yes. Like, it's going to be great for you. Yes. You know, it's like, oh my God. What is happening? What is happening? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, can you, can we talk a little bit more? Cause you mentioned it briefly. You, you mentioned how the sand hills, you, you can't grow grain there. And I think a lot of people don't realize the arable land, non arable land discussion. They're just thinking, like, yeah. you know, if, if you don't, I would say anyone listening, go read about the Dust Bowl, because that's a really fascinating and sad part of our history that kind of highlights it. But can you explain that a little bit more for folks and why cattle are, you touched on it a little bit, but why that is so crucial in this conversation? Yeah, I'd love to. This is, again, another point that like some people are aware of and the people are, are like, keep talking about it, you know? Um, and the people who aren't, I feel like they're always a little bit shocked, but basically what you said, there's arable land versus non-arable land. Um, and essentially what that means is that, um, there is, so you'll hear, I feel like this comes into play a lot with docu-series like, you know, Cowspiracy or any of our favorite docu-series out there. They all like to say like, you know, we're, cattle are taking up 70% of the the land. Like we're using all of this land to feed animals and, um, you know, shame on us, how terrible, but they never follow it up with the important part of the statement. The second part, which is like, we're talking about, that's all it can be used for. Um, so two thirds of farmland, um, is what's called marginal or not arable. So that means you can't grow crops there. You cannot, it's not viable for food production. It's either too hilly, too rocky, you know, it's not fertile enough. Like there's water issues, you know, there's something wrong with the land that it's just not viable for food production. Um, and so, yeah, we could maybe like industrialize it or do something else with it. Um, but like, where does that get us then? Right. Like, um, I think it was Frank or I'm sorry, I think it was Dr. Holder on our podcast too, that talked about, you know, if we want to remove this, this, you know, non-arable land, um, we have to account that we're moving, I think it was close to 15% of 
you know, food production out of, you know, a nation like we talked about earlier, that's already struggling. And I think people are actually um, not as aware. I read a statistic the other day that was like one in 10 in our nation in America are, you know, food insufficient. So it's like, I think it's kind of dangerous to be talking about removing food when, um, you know, not everyone's getting served food to begin with. Um, And as we mentioned earlier in conversation, some of the food we are serving is nowhere nutrient as dense as protein. Right. Absolutely. Is there anything that you think the conventional cattle industry could do to maybe help with the environment or even just help with the messaging around beef right now? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, it's hard to say because I do think I've always said, you know, one of ag's problem is we have a marketing, (laughs) like we don't have like a product issue. We have a marketing issue. So yeah, I think that there's probably a lot of different things that, you know, conventional, um, agriculture could be doing to better market themselves when it comes to environmental standpoint. Um, you know, Diana talks, talks about this a little bit in her book, but if you, people really wanted to compare the the grass or the footprint of grass fed versus grain fed, um, grain fed actually has a lower carbon footprint, um, than grass fed just because as we know, you're finishing the animal quicker, you're harvesting them quicker. So they just, um, they have, they spend less time, you know, emitting methane. And so they, they do have a lower carbon footprint. Um, I do think that it goes back to the conversation we had earlier then, you know, cattle at feedlot are obviously not out grazing at pasture. They're not doing those beneficial things for the soil. So I do think we could look at like, you know, what could, um, you know, conventional again, for me, when people say conventional, I think of feedlots, um, what could they be doing to better balance it? You know, I don't know. It's hard to say. I think some of these feedlots are, they have found the point of, you know, efficiency and production to the best they can. Um, I'm obviously, this gets into the part where like, I advocate and, you know, believe and support in, um, you know, cattle grazing and the regenerative things that agriculture can do. Um, but I support conventional agriculture because of, again, the efficiency and the production they add to, you know, America's, our nation's food industry. Like, um, they serve a point, right? Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. It's hard. It's hard. Yeah. There's definitely probably things they could be doing better, but at the same time, we have an affordable, safe and abundant food system, partly when it comes to protein, animal protein, beef, you know, because of feedlots and the role they play in that. Yeah. I, I really did appreciate Diana's perspective on that, where she was like, basically, you know, if, if someone's struggling with their food budget, um, conventional beef is still a really viable, great source, just because like you said, they're eating the byproducts. Um, they're, all beef, I, I think almost all beef start off on grass. They live in pasture at some point. So they're living in a feedlot for a relatively short period of time. They're eating those byproducts. So I appreciated that nuance that she brings and you mm-hmm. as well to the conversation. I think, you know, I run a lot in the regenerative ag circles and I'm really fond of that mindset, but I think that sometimes we get in the echo chamber there and forget, like you said, that, um, these are really efficient systems and they, came into practice because of their efficiency. Uh, and everyone mm-hmm. wants to dog on the farmers, but they're doing, they, I mean, now that I we're raising beef, the margins are tight, man. Like it's, mm-hmm. it's tight. You have to be mindful of every little thing. And so I think that narrative that the farmers are all big, bad, evil entities is, is not fair because there's a lot of small farmer, family farmers who are just trying to make ends meet and be as efficient as possible. Yeah. I mean, I, there's a whole, um, Again, going back to sometimes we ask for things that we don't quite understand, you know, what it means when we ask for them. I I was actually just down in Puerto Rico a couple weeks ago. American Farm Bureau had their annual convention down there. And so I learned a ton about Puerto Rico agriculture that I had no idea about. Um, And they import 75 to 85% of their food. And 90% Mm -hmm. of that actually comes from the U.S. And so, again, when we talk about shifting these models, um, I am all for supporting local. I am all for buying from your local rancher. I'm all for homesteading and gardening and canning. I implement all of those in my life. Um, but I also think we have to know what's on the other side of that. And that is like, we have the exportation importation, what we raise goes to other places. Um, again, what we raise, you know, helps people at low income afford animal protein at low income afford other, you know, products at the grocery store. Like our, I think we need to sit down. And I think at 
big picture, we need to sit down and be grateful that, um, you know, we do have the food system we have in America, that we're even lucky enough to, again, be sitting around and talking things like this about, you know, where is that conventional or grass fed? There's nations that are not food secure the way the U.S. is, that are having very different conversations about, you know, their um, I would never want to be a, a country that has to import 75% and 85% of their food to feed, like and rely on someone else to feed us. And so I think we have to remember that we have a very safe, affordable and food system. And there are things we need to be paying attention to it to better it. Um, one, for our health standpoint and two, for you know the land and the environment standpoint. Um, but at the end of the day, I feel like we're pretty lucky. Um, and I think COVID even showed that, you know, we had... Um, you know, back orders and things went wrong, but could have been a lot worse, right? Think yeah. about how many mouths we were still able to feed every single day um, through that whole process. So I feel like, yes, it is a fragile system, um, but I'm also pretty proud of like America's farmers and ranchers and for like what COVID showed us that we could still feed um, and do. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that perspective. I think it's important. Um, I think there's definitely things that it, that could be done better. We could improve on, but like you said, we're we're arguing as we're sitting here with full bellies and have full refrigerators <laughs> and, and all of that. So I think perspective is important. And um, I, like I said, I love regenerative ag. I'm very fond of it. But um, I think there's sometimes those discussions happen. Like in a perfect world, we could do this, which is grand, but it's not a perfect world, and we're, we already have to deal with these other factors. So it's good to have different perspectives. Yeah. And- and like you said, I think uh, every farm and rancher loves regenerative ag, right? Mm-hmm. Like we all, that's all what we want, right? We all want to be the most sustainable we can while, you know, being economically profitable. I think people forget that sustainability, there's like three arms to it. There's social, um, environmental, and economic. And so there's actually three things we have to take into account uh, when we're considering sustainability. Um and I love the people out there like Will Harris, right? Mm-hmm. Like I feel like he has he is a shining example of like a very good system that has figured out, you know, again, quotation regenerative agriculture. Um, but I also think that people need to realize there is a whole layer and level of um, like, for lack of a better word, nuance to what we can do as producers to be sustainable. I listened to a great podcast where there was a Colorado beef producer and he was talking about Will Harris and he said, Um, He can run, you know, 3,500 cattle on his 3,400 acres, and that's great. It's a great model for him. Um, Where I'm at in Colorado, and same thing, where we're at in Nebraska, we don't have those same stocking rates. We would need way more land um, than – so that stocking rate, for example. Then we have to play into a role like they get rainfall a lot more than we do here in Colorado, Nebraska. Um, So that plays a role. Um, We have snow here. That also plays a role. I mean, there is so much – So I. Sometimes I I love that there's examples out there and people like Will Harris showing how good agriculture can be. I worry sometimes people think that's just a yes or no choice. It's either yes, be like Will Harris or no, we're choosing not to be. And it's like our job as ranchers is to assess our geographical area, our herd, because even different breeds of animals will be different of what you can run with them. And so it's like our job is to assess what we have and operate with what we have with the best to sustainably we can. And that's never going to be the same for a producer, you know, a rancher down in Texas as a rancher in Georgia, as a rancher in Idaho, as a rancher in upper New York. Like it's just not a yes or no choice. And I'm worried that people are like, well, just do what Will's doing. And you're like, I can't, like, I literally can't do what Will's doing. You know, it would actually degrade our land more. We'd be overgrazing. We'd be like, we'd worsen our land if we did what some of these people did. And so I wish that carried a little bit more into the conversation too. So well said. And that's one conversation that my husband and I have had so much because we run in the homestead circles or a lot of them are back East. And so they have this amazing thick grass like Will Harris and they're like we have to rotationally or move the paddocks every three days or we just get out of control and I'm like yeah Mm. it's not like that here like we get one we love that problem for you yeah we love that problem (laughs) for you congratulations I mean yeah Yeah. like no rain you know how you know what it's like and so Chris and I have had that talk so much like we love that concept maybe we can take a piece of it but we can't mimic it exactly and that's okay Mm -hmm. yeah yep yeah what other myths have you run across related to agriculture that you would like to bust? Uh, we have not talked about factory farms yet. And I okay. feel like that's a big one. That's a heavy word for me. Okay. Um, 
I, when I talk about factory farms, I think the problem is that animal proteins get lumped together. Um, and all of my poultry producers and pig producers are going to hate me. Um, but they are vertically integrated. They're a different system than beef, right? Mm -hmm. So when I say vertically integrated, I mean, Tyson owns the animal from, I don't know, the egg to the end product, right? It's owned by one. Um, beef is not that way. Beef. I have a hard time believing beef will ever be that way. You know, you had mentioned cows start out at grass. All, all cattle do, whether they're Mm -hmm. grain finished at the end or grass fed it's called cow calf. It's mm-hmm. what me and my husband do here in Nebraska. We're a cow calf operation. We raise the animal for the majority of their life out at grass, out at pasture. Then we hand that off to another family that backgrounds the animal. And then they hand that off to another family that is a feedlot or it doesn't enter the feedlot and it stays with the family and they grass finish it. Um, so it's really truly a sector of families that make up the beef industry. Um, you could call the big four, the big packers, mm-hmm you know, a factory, if you want, I'm fine with that. I think they are a factory. They look like a factory to me. Um, but when you lump in all of the cow, you know, the 700,000 farmers and ranchers, um, that are the cow calf that are the, you know, raising it essentially before it gets processed, I have a big problem with that because truly in the beef industry, it is family owned. There's actually, um, a USDA, um, chart out there. And I've been meaning to like make a reel on it, but, um, the average cow her si- herd size is 43. That's tiny. Yeah. That's tiny. You know, my husband and I, we run over 1,000. We're less than 1%. Like we are, yeah. if you want to call a factory farm, that would be my family, my husband and I, and our one hired hand. Yeah. Like that's not a factory <laughs> not farm, a factory, you know? No. Like that's what, that's what our operation is. And so that one's a trigger word for me. Like I have a, um, again, but it's because I think everyone just wants to lump animal proteins together. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good point. Um, and yeah, very true. Any others? Um, I don't think so. We've covered a lot. We've yeah. had a lot of good stuff. Yeah, we have covered a lot of good stuff. Um, for someone who's listening, who they don't, they're not a farmer or a rancher, and maybe, you know, it's a little tricky for them to go give their local farmer and ranchers a hug. What else can they yeah. do to support um, the people who are growing our food or maybe even combat misinformation when they're out roaming the internet? I always tell them if you're out roaming the internet, try and find a farmer or rancher to follow online. Um, do you, you, um, did you do a podcast? I feel like maybe you guys did, um, with Liz of homegrown. Did you guys? Oh, not yet. That right? Not yet. I, oh, you I'd guys love should. You should. You definitely, I have her on my list. You, yeah. Yeah. She always, she has a pretty good saying. That's like the closer you are to your food, kind of like the less questions you have and concerns you have about it. Yeah. I'm way wording that way. She does it more eloquently. Um, and that's where I, I push the like, follow, follow a farmer and rancher on yeah. your, um, social media platform. Again, like Liz says, the closer you are to understanding, um, you know, some of these things, the less concerns you have entering the grocery store, the more you're going to, like you said, be able to feel like you actually hugged and thanked the person. Um, and a lot of your questions will get answered. You know, I show up on my Instagram account almost daily talking a lot about what we did here and not in the way we do, mm-hmm. but you know, I show our cattle out grazing. I talk about our rotation, you know, our rotation management that we use on our operation. And so I think you'll just, I think you'll find it really interesting if you could find a farmer or rancher to follow online. I and nowadays agree. there's a ton of them. I feel like everyone's sharing. So yeah, there's a lot of really good education out there. Um, and I think mm-hmm. that helps combat some of the sensationalism that's floating around. Um, cause man, even <laughs> just even the last few weeks I've noticed, um, that I did, this is totally un. I didn't have it on my list. I'm gonna bring it up. Um, there was this graphic meme thing that came out a couple days ago and it was saying there's a new food pyramid. Um, and oh. they're saying that lucky charms are better than beef. And I like, obviously I'm not a huge fan of government dietary recommendations. I mean, I, I tend to disagree with them, but so I like, I'm not, you know, I have lots of thoughts on that, but I kept looking at that. I'm like, something is missing here. I feel like the whole story is not being told, or maybe there's some sensationalizing happening. Um, did you see that? What did you think? People are going to think I teed you up for this and I did not you guys, but we actually covered that on our podcast this week. So my my podcast discover ag, we take three trending things in the food and ag space and cover it that week and kind of give our opinions on it. It's myself and then a, um, a female dairy farmer down in New Mexico. And that's one of the things we covered this week because it did go viral. Joe Rogan kind of got a hold of it. And I feel like he's who Fox is who originally kicked it off. And then I think he 
there was another account in between him and Fox, but it went viral because of him. The funny thing is we actually covered this on our podcast way back last year in September when this, the food compass originally came out. So it's a tough study. It's called Tufts, T-U-F-T-S. And it is, um, it's called the food compass. And yes, it truly did rank lucky charms higher than some animal proteins. Um, Joe Rogan got the slogan wrong. It's not actually the new food pyramid. It is just one scientific study, one study. Ah, okay. Um, so I think there's a lot of unwarranted fear that we have this new food pyramid that says this. That's not true, you guys. Um, but at the same time, I didn't mind it kind of going viral because I wanted people to see that while the headline was wrong and it is not a new food pyramid, um, there is a study out there saying this. Like this study could eventually affect food policy and Mm -hmm. what does become maybe eventually a food pyramid, which would obviously cause major concern. And so, yeah, it, it's alarming. And my, um, podcast co-host, when we talked about this, she literally said, what's even more alarming is when I shared this in my stories, I had people who said, well, duh, that makes sense. It's fortified. Right. Um, and there's been studies to show that beef is bad. It causes, you know, red meat causes cancer. And we're like, wait till next you know, the next podcast episode, we're covering how that's not true. And so, yeah, I think that it it can, it's kind of scary that we got to the point we got where people, one, believe Lucky Charms is healthier than beef. Two, people believe cows are actually the problem in the environment. Like we've been, we've had ruminants on the earth, how many millions of years, you know, going back to bison and deer. And so some of these, you know, mainstream narratives that people actually believe. I'm like, it is scary that we're at a place where we do have to combat these, which is like I said in the beginning, I'm so grateful there's people out there like you and that are, you know, having these conversations and, um, I don't know, just pushing the right narrative. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it always blows my mind when we can think we being a society think that something new and man-made in a laboratory is going to be better than something that we've had for thousands of years. Um, like, I'm like, that seems very, arrogant of us <laughs> to think that we can do it better. Um, especially when it, I mean, lucky charms, come on people. Uh, I know. Pick something else, <laughs> but <laughs> lucky, lucky charms, my goodness. So, Oh, Natalie, this has been fantastic. Um, anything that you would want to add that we didn't cover? We've made quite, we've covered quite a bit of ground. I feel like. No, I've enjoyed our conversation. Yeah. I think it's been great. Um, Anyone who wants to follow along with more, you can find me um, at my Instagram is kind of my home platform. Um, it's just my name at Natalie Kavorik. And then um, since you're all podcast listeners, yes, um, our podcast is Discover Ag and I would wear Thursday and uh, once a week Thursday episode. So um, I'd love it if you guys tuned in over there. Yes, absolutely. Um, head on over there and give Natalie and her podcast a follow. Uh, I know you'll really enjoy if you like, if you enjoy my content, you'll enjoy her content because it's deep and there's, it's, it's just good. It makes you think. So um, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate your time. I know you have a lot on your calendar, so this was a treat and I know that the listeners are going to really enjoy it. Yeah. Stay safe and stay warm out there. Yeah, you too. <laughs>